Good evening, all. Good evening, all. Uh, I hope everybody. Uh, I hope everybody's well. Evening. Dave, you look like you're a bit. Yeah, Dave, you look. Dave, Mr. Harvey, you look a bit cold there. You got your hat and your gloves on. Is the heating packed up, mate? Is that? Uh, <laughs> oh, I sure was going. <laughs> uh, so I am broadcasting from a rather uh, wet and windy camping field up in uh, North Norfolk. If anybody's coming to Kelling for the uh, for the star party, uh, it'd be good to see you um, over the course of the week. Um, but it, of course, it is uh, very slightly different with all the social distancing rules in place. However, enough about uh, enough about my wailings and uh, tribulations. Uh, way back at episode four, um, if you can remember, uh, we had Steve Tonkin come to talk to us about the many, many ways in which the universe was going to try and kill us. Uh, well, hopefully, by the look of it, a few of us have survived, and Steve has graciously ac accepted our invitation to come back and talk on his favoured subject. Of course, uh, observing with binoculars. Uh, two eyes are better than one. Um, so, Steve, I think we'll, um, uh, we all know about your history and, uh, and the various websites that you run, but binocularsky.com is clearly where you'll find uh, most of Steve's output, so do uh, please pay a visit to that. Um, but I think then um, we are recording as we would do normally, um, and obviously once we get that recording finished, we'll, uh, we'll get it posted up um, on the YouTube channel as normal, uh, and uh, as usual, we'll come back. <laughs> nice is there. Thank you, Martin. Um, uh, we'll come back with uh, with the Q and A session um, at the end. So uh, I think that's my bit done. Then. So Steve, over to you then, sir. Okay. Thank you. Fun. Thanks for having me back. And I see some I see some people here. Mark, for example, who've actually seen this, I think, in the flesh. So uh, glutton for punishment there. Um, right. What I'd like to do over about the next hour ish is go through um, why bother to use binoculars if you are going to use binoculars. How do you choose them? Um, things to avoid, which uh, we'll do that, and, and the, how to use them, and then lastly, things to look at. I'm just not going to give a, a whole list. Look at this and this and this and this. I'll just show you where to find the information and give you some general idea about classes. Otherwise, things get very, very listy, and I'm not a great fan of lists. So without further ado, we will whip over onto screen and you should have my screen up now so here we go so I said first thing we do is why binoculars well we're all told when we start off with astronomy you know start with binoculars you know buy two telescopes strapped together instead of one um, and one of the reasons for that is well they are really excellent beginners instrument but they're also really good if you want to do serious astronomy um, you can get really, really good binoculars. The ones I really like, actually, you can't get hold of anymore. Um, Takahashi astronomers. I wish I'd got them when I had the opportunity many years ago. Because they're portable, which is great. So anything that's portable is likely to get used more. Easy to set up. Ditto. If you can set something up easily, that's also great because you're not having to faff about, um, you know, the, we all know what the weather gets like in Britain and you know, sort of standard thing, go and meet some mates to observe in the forest. And, uh, you know, some of them are quite serious images. And by the time they're set up and ready, it started raining and everything packs up and I've already been observing for 45 minutes, even with big binocs. So that's the side of that that's good. And then there's what's called the binocular advantage. And the binocular advantage is quite simply times 1.4 and this is it comes from the fact that we have evolved to use two eyes and what this effectively means is if you if we're now looking at things right at the limit of visibility if you are struggling to see something with a binocular or a single aperture of or you can just see it with, say, a single aperture of 70 mil, um, you should be able to see it with two apertures of 50 mil. So but you multiply your 50 by 1.4 and you get to 70. So a, a binocular behaves like, when you, and this is only for really faint stuff, when you're really looking at limits of detection, um, it behaves like a single tube of 1.4 times the aperture. So 70 mil binoculars, like 100 mil telescope and all the rest of it. And there's um, some perfectly good 
reasons for this. It's what's called statistical summation, and there, which is just improved probability of detection with two eyes. You go use two detectors when you're looking for things which are faint, you're going to improve your probability of detection. That's just stats. And then there's physiological summation, which images, um, images will, will call stacking ultimately, but we've only got two images to stack. And what it means is if you have, if, if you have two pathways to your visual cortex, you get a load of neural noise and you can wipe out some of the neural noise by stacking two images together. And we do it all the time. So it's, we get this um, improved signal to noise ratio. And this is, this is absolutely standard optics. You could, and you can try this for yourself. Um, if you look at something that you can just about distinguish, with both your eyes open, you know, so take a book further and further and further away from you or something like that. Uh, just when you get that limit, then close your least good eye and all of a sudden you can't, you, you can't see it as well anymore. And this is all to do with being involved to use two eyes. So, you know, there's good reasons for this, but there's other things as well. So you get false stereopsis. Things look, when you use two eyes, and this is bi uh, bino viewers with a single scope as well, do the same thing, you, you get this, false 3D effect. Well, obviously you're not getting the 3D image of something as light years away. You know, 3D works a hundred yards max, I think. Uh, but it's, it really does give you that impression. And if we can't enjoy what we're looking at, then, well, why, why bother? Um, and the 3D image, I have to say, is sometimes, because some of it's color-based, is sometimes quite spectacularly wrong um, in the same way that some of the worst Facebook 3D images, you know, as you move the thing around, are spectacularly wrong. And it has also been said, I've never done this, um, that you, it negates the effect of the blind spot, that sometimes you, the thing you're looking at with one eye can fall on the blind spot and you just don't see it. And, uh, and of course, that can't happen with two because the blind spot will be in a uh, different position in the image with the other eye. Um, I say, I've never actually I've been told this happens. I don't actually know it happened. So binoculars, what do we want? Well, we divide them into, I, well, I divide them into three kinds. So there's poro prisms, roof prisms, and things with angled eyepieces. I've put 45 degrees because that's what mine are like. So poros look like that if you cut them away and the light comes in here, that prism turns the image right way round, left, right. This one here turns it the right way up and then out the eyepiece there. And it's folding the light path, which is quite useful as well. So as well, those prisms, as well, as well as giving you the image the right way round, the right way up, <coughs> excuse me, uh, will, are also making for a shorter instrument because, because of the folding. And that means it's easier to hold steadily, easy to mount and all the rest of it. Um, so that's a ray trace of the light path approximately. Okay. Advantages of poros is they're generally, although this is changing now with um, improved manufacturing techniques, but they are generally the best quality in any given price range. I'll show you one spectacularly uh, bad exception to that later. And they're also relatively easy to, to self-maintain. And if you get the budget ones, um, they are, let's be find a budget one here. Oh, uh, things like these. Giveaways are these like the sort of double indents here, but the Celestron um, Skywatch is the same. You know, so, something like this, which, which you can pick up for about 60 quid. Um, they do have issues with them. You get things like um, the prisms tend to slip. So being able to sort of fix them yourself is, is quite useful because it always goes the day after they've come out of warranty. Um, but they're bulkier and heavier than uh, roof prisms, which we'll look at in a mo. And the cheap ones, as I just mentioned, really easily lose collimation. Um, and it's because of the way the prisms are put. And I'll show you that later. Then you sort of have an idea what you're dealing with. Roofs are the ones that look like this. And that's the light path. The light is folded inside a prism here. The other thing to notice um, is that the focusing is all internal. Um, and that makes them much easier to waterproof. So advantages of roofs is they're lighter and more compact, much easier to waterproof. And that's largely due to the internal focusing. 
but they're more expensive because that roof prism inside there has to be made to 90 times the precision of a poro prism. So they, and that is expensive to do it properly. They also really need something called phase coating um, because of the way the, um, the same image is, is split apart and then put back together in the roof. Um, you get a bit of destructive interference, but that, that can be pricey if it's, if it's done well. And they're much, much more difficult to self-maintain. I don't mind stripping down um, Poro Prism binoculars and putting them back together again. Um, roofs, I won't touch them. Okay. And the aperture is also limited by the straight through design. Because they're approximately straight through, if your eyes are, say, 60 millimeters apart, you can't have tubes bigger than 60 millimeters. If you've got mass like that, well, obviously they can't line up with your eyes. So that's, uh, that's a, a problem there. Angled eyepieces, great. I love my 45 degree binos, and that's the uh, end there. And the, but this thing that creates the angle, which is, of course, more glass, has to be of very good quality or is going to degrade your image again. And that means a good quality glass ultimately costs money. And I have to say, as astronomers, we are cheapskates when it comes to binoculars. Uh, birders will think nothing of spending over a thousand pounds on a 42 mil binocular. Ha, we will. Right, advantages. Much more comfortable to use. Really high elevations, but they're much more expensive and they must be mounted. Um, it's, it's impossible to use binoculars like that if, if, they're, if they're not properly mounted. And you do need some sort of a finder. So that's there. So what do we want? Binoculars described by two numbers, and that is magnification times aperture. So let's look at a few. Um, I'll take the screen off in a moment. Let's do this directly. So, uh, Screen share, stop share. Right. So, have you got me in your big as your big speaker now? Yes. Yeah. Right. Yep. Great. So, um, eight by forty twos, little binoculars like this. Great. Anybody can handhold these. Um, I fundraised for. I've eventually got a dozen of these for outreach work, and I, I use them with kids, you know, sort of eight year, eight year olds can hold things like this steadily, provided they know how to. Um, something like a 10 by 50, which is uh, getting a bit bigger now, you think. Again, most people can learn to handhold if they're taught to do it properly. And we'll have a look at that in a moment. We then get up to the the very, very common um, 15 by 70 size of thing, or if you get them, 16 by 70s, same sort of thing. People say they can handhold these, and you can for a little while, but they are, it's not really very satisfactory. They're they will shake, and uh, nobody can really hold 15 times magnification straight. And then you get the much bigger things. So um, go back to the screen share. Right. So, so eight, easy. 10 by 50s, most people can. 15 by 70s. And then something like 25 by 100, something like that, must be mounted. Again, you know, you get, you get sort of, you say, yeah, I could hold these. Well, no, you can't really. So what sort of size do you want? Well, let me give you a, a sort of idea of what you can see. <clears throat> In the middle of that is um, M35, that lovely little cluster in Gemini, which is uh, coming up late at night now or early in the morning. Um, and this is just, it, we'll have a look at what it looks like in different binoculars and, and uh, different conditions of light pollution. So 15 by 70, it looks a bit like that. You notice the sky background got darker, it's got bigger, and you can see a bit more in it. You get the big brutes on it, and it's lovely. Okay, light pollution, and we'll just compare the either end of that, the 1050 and the 3700. Um, this, the ones I've been showing, are approximately what it's like for my back garden, which is between the New Forest and Cranbourne Chase. 
If I go down to Bournemouth, which we do sometimes because we work uh, with schools down in Bournemouth sometimes, that's the equivalent. <laughs> And you can see it's sort of washed out. But you ask, what you are seeing is that aperture does compensate very, very slightly for light pollution, okay. which, of course, is why you can use a, a telescope with, with aperture for looking at f first mag stars during the day. Um, but if you go up to somewhere like Loch Loyal, um, or I don't know how dark Kelling is, uh, does, but you suddenly see the effect. This is the effect of a pristine night sky and this is the sort of thing we're actually working for to get on Cranbourne Chase at the moment uh, uh, International Dark Sky Reserve a year ago got the status so we need to maintain and improve that and hope we can get something like that uh, I doubt we will though there's too much else around okay holding binoculars try this um, you'll notice the top joint there's my wife modeling those um, the top joint of her thumb fits perfectly in the corner of the eye. Um, come out of screen share. And I will... and that. So you know, try this. That joint fits perfectly there. And it's comfy. And if you hold binoculars, I'll do it with the little ones because it's easiest. Two fingers round the uh, round the eyepieces, two fingers on the prism housing and then put them up like that you've suddenly created a a triangular structure so you've got the uh, you've got the advantage of a triangular structure and that gives you much much more stability most people find that much more stable you think you're going to drop them at first you're not um, I even do that with quite big binocs um, sometimes big big heavy brutes and we you still don't get the sort of the dropping thing um i didn't, I didn't realize there's gonna be practical demonstrations steve i'd have got my i'd have got mine out mate if i didn't know oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah i'm um well when, when i do this as a, as a as a proper talk you know i bring loads of kit for people to play with um it takes about half an hour just to set the kit up at the beginning of the talk <laughs> <laughs> anyway so we've got a, we've got a stable structure here with a uh, basically you know two parts of the arm then the head neck creating a, a stable triangle which, which is immediately gives you a bit more stability and the other thing is as you're looking higher and higher your arms get higher and higher as your arms get higher and higher the blood supply to them decreases and they start aching but if you hold them if you hold them like that what you do what you get is as you're going for particularly if your head supported as you recline more weights taken on your head which is used to having uh, carrying a bit of weight hopefully you've got something inside it and uh, well that's and it's it's actually much more so much 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 more comfortable and once you get the hang of this it becomes second nature it's not so good when you're looking at stuff at ground level i have to say but it's really good for, for stuff at ground level what you want to do we'll come out of that again so we are whipping backwards and forwards between things at ground level do it the way the american military teach you to do it which again is better, which is hold them by the by the objective lens like that. It again, that is much more stable. If you're trying to hold big ones or bigger ones, you can do a, a double-handed hold. So you hold two hands on one side and rest the other side on your on your wrist, the other side, and hold them like that. And that can steady them up as well. There's lots and lots of things, ways you can do this. If you really want to get very, very uh, Stick your arms through the the strap and brace them like that. Don't push too hard or you snap the strap, but embrace them like that, whichever, whichever way you like to hold them. And that's, if you've ever done any range shooting with a rifle, the sort of uh, lazy sling, when you wrap the rifle sling around your, around your forearm, um, that's the, the, the same sort of principle there. And then there's mounting them. So mounting... Most people will say, right, we go for a tripod. And so this is what's happening with a tripod. Um, 
and you'll notice you immediately get start getting this territorial dispute between legs or among legs. And if you try to bring a stool into the thing or a seat, you know, you're adding another four legs to this, all of which need to be in the same place. It's also, as you can see here, it's really awkward to look at anything above about 45 degrees elevation. So there, you, you really need to find some other way of doing things. And the thing I really like, but I'll show you a few other bits and pieces before, is one of these things, which is a, a trigger grip head on top of a monopod. And the trigger grip head has a, a quick release plate on it. This is a Manfrotto 222. They're not made anymore, but you can get them really good nick still on um, uh, a certain auction site. And as long as you've got the, the mounting bar here on your binoculars, that just sits in there. Always check that it's locked. And then that on a monopod is really, really easy to use. And the monopod doesn't even have to be vertical. Okay, you can, your monopod can be at an angle. I discovered that um, my wife came home one day and I had a soldering iron out and what I was, so, I wasn't soldering, I was uh, burning a hole with, with just, with, just would have been just where um, my crotch is just about on, a, on a, my favorite garden recliner. So that I could get a monopod down there. I thought that would be the best place for it. Um, did that. And I realized it was no steadier than having it down the side of the recliner. So, you know, it's, uh, I didn't need to make a hole in it, but it's still got the hole there for posterity. So it doesn't even need to be vertical and it's really, really useful thing to have. Right, let's go back. So that's your monopod. Um, Patrick Moore used to recommend these things. They're, they're called neck pods, which is a silly name for it anyway. Um, it's basically a strap that hangs around your neck. Um, and then it's like a little monopod on top of it and there you you can adjust tensions and all the rest of it um it's all right it's actually quite a good heartbeat monitor as well you can actually see you can see your pulse in the in the heavens so that's the monopod different kind of these are cheap chinese trigger group hey they come with rubbish instructions if you do get one of those want to know how to use it i've actually written a proper instruction manual and put it on the website so you can pull that down there um they will be stiff, they will be, they'll never ever lubricate the ball there. And then, you know, the pierce de resistance, which I can't, I'm afraid, set up in, in here, um, is something like a parallelogram mount, which takes you away from the, um, it, it takes you away from the tripod so that the legs are no longer in the way. And the nice thing about that, whatever height you put this at, the binoculars are still facing the same thing, pointing at the same thing. So during um, when I'm doing outreach and stuff like that, I can find something and then just drop the parallelogram and um, young kids without having to be held up or, you know, and really find it awkward, find it awkward can actually see what I've been looking at. So that's, that's a nice way to do that. Um, a longer arm one, here's a couple of 20 by 80s on that. Um, I haven't changed the setup here at all. It's just the angle, angle of photography is different. So that's standing, looking at binoculars, and then um, putting out a recliner and lying down and doing it. So that's, that's the beauty of these things. And really, really enjoy um, just scanning the heavens with, some, with something that is, is nice, nicely engineered and you can lie back comfortable. Yes, I have sometimes fallen asleep doing that. Or you can, you don't have to go for things like that. So um, this is a, a, a cheap little beach chair. You know, you can put it across the armrests of the, this is the famous recliner with the hole down the middle there somewhere. Or, you know, now this is high tech, this one here. We've got, we've got a swivel chair there. And just using this as a frame to steady the binoculars, same beach chair or um, make do monopod. Um, this is a very, very deluxe, this one. You can adjust the height of it. Um, it's also cranked there. So it, it holds the so-called vertical bit clear of astronomer's belly, which is quite useful. And uh, you just bungee um, binoculars to the, to the top end. And it's perfectly adequate. It's not good, but it's, you know, you make, make do. Um, Anything you can use to steady your arms and hands is great. 
um, fences, trees, the ground, um, uh, just just about anything, rooftop, uh, car, car rooftops and such like. Or there's the other extreme. This is uh, basically, it's a computer controlled chair. It's a, she's in a, she's actually sitting in an Altaz mount with socking great 40 by 150 Fujinons in there. Yeah, um, it's called a star chair. It's actually not made anymore, but this is the sort of thing people were, were going for. And this will hold just about anything. And you just dial in where you want to go and zoom, it takes you there. So those are, and people are making their own type of things that do that now. Some of them powered with things like drills and bicycle chains and all the rest of it. Um, the amateur telescope making community is very, very creative. Dew becomes a problem whenever you've got anything mounted because it's spending much more time pointing upwards. Um, these are bits of my wife's um, former yoga mat, which uh, it's, a, it's a cheap, horrible thing as a yoga mat. So I've got her a decent one and because this was ideal for making dew shields and uh, made dew shields just by everything out of this. This one here, which is on my Sir Rigel Quick Finder, that on there, I've had that out. I've left that out for 10 hours on a dewy night. Nothing. And that was point, I had it just left on the, on the table pointing straight up. So absolutely nothing on the, on the screen on that. So that works quite well. Nothing really has long enough um, uh, dew shields. So even these fancy binoculars that have got extendable dew shields, they're not good enough. So it's just, that's just a single piece that wraps around them both. Now I can get about two or three hours observing with that. Focuses. Um, center focusing binoculars are really convenient if you're refocusing a lot. But you, one of the problems you have, well, two problems. One, one is you, you've got a place for water to get in there. And if you put O-rings in, if you put O-rings in there to seal it, then you get focus lag. Um, if you, but, and also, they, because they focus by moving that, if you put any pressure on that, this eyepiece bridge could rock and you actually defocus them. So astronomers tend to go for individual eyepiece focusing because once, you, once they're set up, you don't have to refocus them in a session. They, that's just fine. You just, you just leave them. And it's much more convenient. Um, don't, they don't accidentally refocus. They, they're much easier to waterproof. So what should you get? Well, um, internet advice, not something I have seen on uh, Stargazer's Lounge, I have to say, for many years. <laughs> um, more than 10, I would think. As long as you get binoculars with back four prisms with fully multi-coated optics, you can't go far wrong. Rubbish. This is, there is so much hype around these things. So that's uh, some binoculars I either have or used to have. Um, and we're going to look at these two here. So let's look at what it actually says on them. So this is a 15 by 70. So is this. Broadband fully multi-coated, fully broadband multi-coated. Yeah, so they must be the same, yeah? Back four prism, back four prism. How different can they be? Well, let's find out. First of all, this business about back four prisms. It's, um, you'll notice on the top one here, which is using borosilicate glass, uh, back stands for barium crown, BK is, is borosilicate crown. Um, you've got to hear, some little gray cutoffs. And that means right at the periphery of the field of view, ultimately, you're getting a little bit of vignetting. It's, it's being faded out. You, how often do we really have our object of interest right near the edge? We put it in the middle. It's not a, it's not a big deal. You don't get the same thing here when the, uh, with the back four, the, the barium crown. But what you do get is something very, very different. I mean, look, look which has got the better stray light control. Now, I would argue that actually this might be the better binocular <coughs> because stray, stray light is a pain and this one's got terrible stray light control. Um, and if you, anyone into bino viewers, you know, your really good ones like the Denkmeyers, guess what glass they use? This, it's not bad glass, it's just, you know, if it's used inappropriately, if you've got really, really wide angle binoculars, so 10 by 50 to eight and a half degrees or something, yeah, that, that is going to be a bit awkward. But, um, but generally, it's, not, it's, it's really not as much of a problem as people make. But it gets even worse than that. 
Um, the Chinese back four, which has got this way of writing it, all capitals, isn't even a barium crown glass. They've just used the same designation as Schott AG, the German glass manufacturer. Uh, it's not the same glass. It's actually, a, it's actually a phosphate crown glass, but back four's got a good name. So yay, this is, this is marketing. This is just marketing talk. Um, and it's, but that, okay, phosphate crown isn't necessarily bad. But what it does have, it's got a hundred times the permitted inclusion rate that this other one has. And what that translates at is a slightly milkier image, which you can actually see on brightly colored flowers on a nice sunny day or something like that. You can tell the difference immediately between the two. More important with the prisms is how they're held in binoculars. Decent ones are held in, that's a proper prism cage here. Um, hint, if you're ever trying to collimate binoculars at all, anything with a cross head is holding something together. Don't undo it. If you've got something with a slot head, then that is a collimation screw. Okay, that's that's the, uh, the but this is a proper, you see, this is a proper prism cage which comes out. There's your collimation screw there, you can see it quite nicely. And it just tilts the prisms slightly. Your cheaper binoculars, if you're lucky, the clip that holds them in is held in with at least a screw at one end, but some of them aren't, they're just, whoops, back. back. Um, and on the outside here, which you can't see, there's a little screw that you can, you can get at from the outside and that you move to tilt the prism and so, and so you can collimate them like that. You can you know, ch shift the image. Um, it's, it's not difficult to do it for one person to use, but the moment you change the, uh, distance between the eyepieces, um, you're almost certainly going to mess up the collimation. But we're not going to talk too much about collimation. Fully multi-coated. Well, here's the thing, folks. There's no industry-wide standard what fully multi-coated means. It can mean the air glass surface of the lenses got two layers of coatings. That can pass as fully multi-coated. What well, means all the air glass surfaces, and that includes the prism hypotenuses, have properly applied seven layer coatings. They're not the same. They're clearly not the same. And we can see that here on those two binoculars with the same sort of fully broadband multi-coated. Um, in, the, in the specification, this is what we get when we shine a light down them. One is chucking back a heck of a lot more light because the coatings are meant to be anti-reflective than the other. And this is a difference. So I think we could say those two things don't tell us a lot, but this one surely has to. 15 by 70, right. That there is the 15 by 70 I showed you earlier. This is just a setup on my kitchen work surface, a um, bit of baking parchment, uh, laser here, um, going through green laser pen, going into an old finder because I wanted a broad parallel beam coming out and uh, proper beam boardens beam are expensive and a finder does the same thing. So the idea is you've got collimated light going into the eyepiece and that will basically trace your light path for you and what you get here is actually the equivalent aperture, or the, the effective aperture, should I say, of the binocular. And that's what it, I had a scale in front of it. Uh, I'm not a very good photographer, as you can see, but these so-called 15 by 70 binoculars are actually, that is 62 millimeters. These are 62 mil binoculars. Um, well, but they can be sold as 15 by 70s, and because you do actually have 70 millimeters of clear aperture there, but they do something, which I'll show you later, light path. Now, you don't have to faff about with lasers, okay? You can, this is graph paper, so I'm not very good at images. Hold it up to a bright sky, not the sun, okay? Move the graph paper backwards and forwards until you get a sharp image of the exit pupil. When you've got a sharp image, we are being graph paper, you can actually measure it quite easily. Or if you want to go fancy, you can get something like a jeweler's loop and make a little scale to go in front of that on um, semi-translucent uh, tape or something like that over a half of it. There's, there's loads of ways you can do it. Or you can just shine a blooming light, torchlight, or even your phone LED light down into the, into the eyepiece. Just hold it about six, eight inches back and it'd be perfectly okay. And I'll show you some of this in a bit. And this is what we got. So when you've got your exit pupil, 
you multiply it by the magnification and that will give you the, the real aperture. So the laser gave me 62. An LED, in other words, my phone torch, gave me 62 and a half. Not, it's, because it's not quite parallel enough, but it's, it's close enough. I mean, we're, you know, sort of a, less than a percent difference there. The exit pupil gave me just over 60 mil. All of it means it's not 70. So that's rubbish as well. So don't believe what's written on the, uh, on the cover plates because there are loads of things it doesn't tell you. This is gonna go out on the net and I, I'll be, happily send anybody who wants a PDF of the slide if they, if they want it for themselves. These are things that make a load of difference. And there is no way you're going to be able to get this from the specs. Okay, and from what, you know, even really good ones won't tell you all of these things. And the ultimately what it comes down to is the only way you can tell if binoculars are any good for you is get them out under a nice dark sky. Please use a starry sky because it's a much better test of um, optics than uh, daytime. Hold the things up to your head. And if they work for you, they work for you. Um, try a few. Don't make the mistake I did if you can't afford it. Um, a mate of mine uh, leads birding tours, or used to before lockdown, around the world. He's got some, um, uh, what's that good mate? Um, Swarovski. He's got some Swarovski 10 by 50s. I looked through those once. I mean, they're, 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 they were only 1800 quid at the time. Um, <laughs> and the binoculars that I had that I thought were pretty good until then, I realized how, how good they weren't. The, these things, good glass is incredible. It's like looking through nothing and getting a magnified view. It is, it, they are so good, uh, but that's it. So what do we avoid? We avoid BSOs, not DSOs, BSOs. A BSO, I will um, stop the screen share and I will demonstrate what one of these things is. This is a BSO. It's a binocular shaped object. It is a horrible thing. And I'll just pop the lights out because this will help to, I can do a few things with this, but it'll help to show how horrible it is. Bear with me a second. We're going to use the screen, the, um, I've got the microphone somewhere near my mouth. We are going to use the ceiling as a screen. Here we go. Doesn't have to be perfect, but that should be good enough. Now, the first thing we need to know, understand, as I've mentioned before, is what coatings are for. Coatings are meant to be anti reflective. Um, these little binoculars have the best coatings I've got on anything at the moment. So I'll use those to show what a good coating does. And here we go. Now we're reflecting light off the coating and you can just about see a little bit of it on the ceiling there. We take this abomination. And can you tell the difference? <laughs> what they're doing, this is the latest ruby coatings. They're basically getting rid of the red end of the spectrum. Right. Now, we we'll go back to a, a decent 70 mil binocular. Now, just have a look at, this is the testing the aperture thing. Now, you can see with, oh, let's do that one. With respect to that light fitting there, how big the uh, disc of light coming out of here is. It's very slightly bigger than the light fitting. We take this thing and it's smaller than the light fitting. Actually what's coming out of this so-called 70 mil binocular is actually 50 millimeters. So it's, it's not even the, the rubbishy old 62 we got with the other one. And the way, and this is all done for the same reason. One, if you get rid of the red end of the spectrum, your color correction doesn't have to be so good. If you get rid of the, the outer rays of the beam going in, which you should be able to see 
Maybe a little torch will help in that. No, it's over brightening it. Um, in here is a little metal diaphragm. And what, it, what it's doing at the entrance to the prisms there, and what, what it's doing is it's um, cutting out the peripheral rays. If you cut out the peripheral rays, you don't have to correct for them so much. So those are some of the things that are wrong with it. The other thing that's wrong with it is what this lever here is all about, and that is zoom. There is no such thing as a good zoom binocular, the end. They don't, they just don't exist. Um, we've also got possibly some of the rockiest eyepieces on the planet. Um, you know, I said in a certain book, I was surprised that Sylvester Stallone hasn't actually sued for intellectual copyright, they're so rocky. Um, they, so what you get is a really horrible soft focus at the wide end of the zoom. Wide, it's like looking down a tube, toilet roll tube or something like that. You always get two images for the price of one. Because of those ruby coatings, everything gets a sort of horrible blue-gray hue. So it looks like the entire universe has undergone some sort of zombie apocalypse or something like that. And they are just real rubbish. 80 quids worth these, that these were. No, I didn't buy them. Um, they were actually donated by the, the widow of the man who had them. I use them for, t for teaching kids. So I just put them out and say, see what you can find wrong with those folks. Um, teaching kids how to start evaluating stuff. Right, I think we've probably had enough of my ugly dial. So let's have a look at that. So BSOs, zoom, rubbish. Ruby coatings, rubbish. Focus free binoculars, possibly okay for some terrestrial uses but really for astronomy rubbish quick focus by which i don't mean things like the, the decent um uh, i think zeiss and Leica do some relatively quick focus ones not not those but things like the tasco zip where you've got about a quarter of a turn of the focus wheel between whatever its close focus is and to infinity and beyond and it's just impossible to get precise focus with that you know it's it's a again it's a gimmick um, one of the nicest focusing mechanisms I've got, one I haven't got room for on the table in here at the moment, um, is, uh, is one where actually the, the focus slows down as it approaches infinity. Um, it's a nice, nice little vixen, and you can get them so precisely. It's lovely. So we know what not to get. What are we going to look at? Well, let's go for it. We've got open club. Well, I'll go back again. Open clusters, asterisms, large diffuse nebulae, large faint galaxies, very large globular clusters, and I do mean very large, some planetary nebulae, and for very small values of some, and variable stars and double stars. We'll just have a look at a few of those. So these are all 10 by 50-ish on a pretty dark sky, unless I tell you otherwise. That's M31. And you can see, you can see core brightening. You can see the light cuts off um, more easily one side, more abruptly one side than the other. We're looking at the, well, we're not looking at it, we've detected the effect of the dust lane. And that's, that you can do in a reasonably dark sky with something like 10 by 50s. Um, something like M33, which we think of as being a large galaxy, really isn't. It's, it's you know, it, it takes some looking at, but it's a darn sight better in that than in, um, you know, sort of cheap department store telescopes. M27, this is what I mean, some planetary nebulae. This is the big brute. That little smudge there, you can just about tell that it's slightly elongated in 10 by 50s. Planetary, this is not the instrument of choice for planetary folks, just as it isn't really the instrument of choice for planets and the moon. And the moon. Although, you know, you can see Galilean moons with it. Um, but, you know, I've seen Galilean moons with little cardboard bodied plastic lens things. I've seen um, um, Callisto. Right, M13 looks about yay big, and that's the big brute. Okay, well, M22 is actually bigger, but it's more difficult to find and see. But once we get onto asterisms, then we're really, really looking at where binoculars absolutely excel. This is Kemble's Cascade, it's in Camilla Padlis. I'll show you how to find it in a bit. And what we've got is this lovely, almost straight string of stars, bright one in the middle. Um, just after I'd come to the Northern Hemisphere, Bob Meissen showed me this, and 
it's actually like a wristwatch, isn't it? You know, so there's a strap, there's a star, but you've got a little cluster down the bottom as well, uh, NGC 1502. And on in autumn evenings, like so like now, this is almost vertical in the sky. And you can imagine it's this little ribbon waterfall with a splash pool at the bottom. And it's lovely. And it's it's a really nice thing, you know, to, to show people, to show people who are new to this, there's things in the sky that are worth looking at. Um, Eddie Carpenter, some of you may know, uh, Cotswold Astronomical Society. Um, he's been showing people this for ages. And this is Eddie's coaster. He just, this is the middle star in the W of Cassiopeia down here, Navi or whatever they call it nowadays. And so get that at the bottom of a 10 by 50 view and you're, or the, the, at the south of a 10 by 50 view, should I say, and then you'll if you get that. Then we've got this curve of stars here. It do, they don't appear on star charts and apps and stuff like that, but they're absolutely perfect in that. And, um, you know, we've actually got Steve Coe, you know, a little bit of people sort of suggesting it, um, mostly actually organized on the pages of Star Trek, as I seem to remember, um, to recognize that, hey, this is something that should be on the official list of asterisms. So get out there and have a look, because there are loads of things. I mean, I find things that you know, shapes that I think, hey, that looks quite nice. What is it? Um, so you, I'm, I'm making my own list of asterisms, which is, and you can do the same. You know, it's a disguise for everybody. Um, the coat hanger <laughs> asterism. Great gift for kids at star parties because, again, it looks like an everyday object. This one, nice winter object, this, colander 70. And normally, um, as Mark will know, because I think I did that when I came up to talk to his club, the, um, if you go into a room of amateur astronomers and say, right, put this picture up and say, right, who's seen Colander 70? You might get, if you're lucky, half a dozen hands up. You've all seen Colander 70. These are the three belt stars of Orion. But everyone goes, oh, that, yeah. Now, what we're looking at is down there. So everyone just goes straight down to the nebula. Don't lurk around here with binoculars. It is lovely. It's this huge OB association of stars. It's so nice, these hot blue white stars. Um, and well, I do tell people, look at this S-shaped group of stars going here, going around there. And they can look at that. You can remember, oh yeah, it was Steve that told me to look. No, it's, no, don't. It's, uh, if you don't want that image, let's, let's change it. There's the S. So that's the swan's neck and there's its wings, okay? And it's, but make, make, of it what you, make of it what you want, but spend some time there. It's beautiful curves and knots and twists of stars. Now you can actually see more than this with 10 by 50s, and it's beautifully framed. And then go and have a look at the nebula afterwards because the nebula won't be nearly as good as this in, in the size of binocular. M45, Pleiades, absolutely stunning in binoculars. Um, Really, really, really is. You can tell when someone's seen it for the first time in binoculars because it's exactly the same noise they make the first time they see Saturn in a telescope. It's wow, because it's like somebody's just scattered diamond dust onto a black velvet sky. It's so, so lovely. And what can be quite fun, actually, if you're getting people when it's out when it's when it's rising, have a look at, and it's a bit sort of meh when it's sort of down near the horizon. Um, uh, and once it's you know above about 30 degrees high, it is so spectacular, absolutely lovely. Um, getting a bit late for this now, but the, but the Southern Milky Way, Summer Milky Way, M24, something like this. There are more stars in this particular field of view than you will get in any other 10 by 50 field of view anywhere in the sky. So this is you know, sort of getting towards the heart of our galaxy. That's lovely, M24. Um, big binox, diffuse nebula like the Rhine Nebula, you start seeing detail and structure. It's great. So how do you find out where to get this stuff? Well, I think probably most people know I write a monthly binocular tour for Sky at Night Mag, and there's um, just six objects in there, all in the same part of the sky, um, nominally four for 10 by 50s, um, and two for 15 by 70s. Well, here's the thing, folks, because of this stopping down problem that we have with binoculars, and most people sort of starting out for this, um, won't, 
were, may well have had budget binoculars, all the 10 by 50 ones I can see with 40 mil or, or less, and all the 15 by 70 ones I can see with 50 mil or less, so that they, they should all be possible. I once made the mistake of putting in something which I did actually need 70 mils to see, and nobody could see it. So never again will I make that mistake. Um, just try and keep things there. And a lot of um, clubs I know use this as part of their sort of beginners program. So that's a useful one. Or every month I produce uh, this thing, which is Binocular Sky Newsletter, it just tells you what's in the sky at the, sky at the time. So we still got August stuff up on here, but that doesn't really matter. This, so that, and that's completely free and you can just subscribe to it and that. Um, and you can get that at my website, which is binocularsky.com, which is, whoa, there we go. Uh, also on there is stuff to find. So you can put in your, your observing area criteria, so in your latitude and put in your horizon altitude. So if, you know, if you've got guns up to, or trees or whatever up to 25 degrees, no point in me choked chucking out objects to do there. I was really just doing this as an exercise in teaching myself how to um, sort of try and work with databases. Um, you can multi-select of object type constellation. You can't, obviously you can't multi-select limiting magnitude. Um, you can select your binocular aperture. So lots of ways you can do this thing. Oh, bother oh, fiddlesticks. Okay, um, and the order in which you want the, the data that it throws up. Okay, so constellation, magnitude, object type, right ascension if you want it. Um, it's matter, and then you, you click submit, and you'll get, say, for those things I had in, you'll get something like this. So stock two, and you see, so those those are the, are, uh, it says here they are open clusters in Cassiopeia, limiting magnitude eight. Okay. Then you click on these and it will take you to the page. Alternatively, if you if you don't really not want to know, you can get, just get a whole sky chart and each of these little squares, there's a key up at the top that tells you what it is. Um, each one of these little squares um, is an object. You hover over it and it will tell you what it is. You click on it and it'll take you to the object page. And this is what an object page looks like. So back to Kimball's Cascade. It has a big chart to show you whereabouts in the sky it is. It tells you what size that aperture ring is. So this is safe for, for 10 by 50, it's approximately five degrees, because they almost all got five degree clear aperture or bigger, uh, a field of view or bigger. Okay, tells you how to find it. In this case, if you'll go out and find Kemble's Cascade tonight, because do, because it's lovely. This is the W of Cassiopeia. You take the distance between those stars there, you could measure it with your fingers up in front of them like that and move it along exactly the same amount and bang, you'll be on it. Get the, get the binoculars there. If you don't see it, go slightly higher. Almost always, if, we, if we're missing our target, where we think it is with binoculars, it's because we're too low. Okay, so it shows you how to find it. Um, and then you've got sort of uh, ordinary find a chart and um, image of approximately what you might see and a description of it and stuff like that. So that's that's there. There's um, I'm just over 300 objects in the database at the moment. So my aim is to get up to 600 um, while I'm still on the green side of the turf, COVID permitting. Right. Alternatively, um, keep me and my family in food for Christmas and all the rest of it by buying a copy of this or this for everybody you know. Um, Either, I think this one, some people have said it's the most comprehensive book on binocular astronomy ever written. Um, some people don't like it. Okay, I think it's too much about the binoculars, not enough about the astronomy. I'm beg to differ, but uh, yeah. And this one here, I pulled, I brought out um, a couple of years ago because people tell you start with binoculars and then they don't tell you how to do it. And this has got basically two chapters per month of the sky. And the idea is you work through this book for a year and it will give you a pretty good understanding and familiarity with most of the sky. And I put in loads of little bits of miscellany and stuff in there as well. The problem with, and it says so on the back page, it's intended for use with a decent star chart because I wanted to keep the price right down to make it as available as possible. Um, so the charts in here are monochrome and they're actually too small. 
Um, you can, there's a link in the book, you can download um, color charts from the, from the internet and print them out if you want, or have them on your laptop screen or uh, tablet screen or, or whatever. So there, there is a, um, a fix to it, but the idea is really to try to get people looking up with binoculars because most people once they've had a go at it not everybody I have to say but most people once they've had a go at it and been shown a few things they love it i know a number of people who have moved on from from one using one eye to using two so that's uh that's me this is binocular astronomy um thank you for listening if you're still there and uh <laughs> i will hand you back to uh Daz and Grant, so Steve, that was great. Thanks, uh, thanks very much indeed. Uh, I have to say, Steve. it's one of my one of my favourite things when I come to star parties. I, I've got a I've got a pair of uh, a ten by fifty, probably like uh, like most people. Uh, is uh, I, I sit on the dark side of the um, uh, of the hobby. I'm afraid, Steve, when the camera is doing its bit, I had nothing better than sitting in the chair with binoculars and scouting scouting through the skies. An M45, yep. you're right, is, is absolutely gorgeous in my binoculars. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Well, I'm, you know, I, I, I do the dark side as well. I'm just not very good at it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We all we all say that. We all say that. Absolutely. Well, uh, well, quick, well I quick... spent two and a half. Uh, no, uh, no, we don't want to go there. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, quick question: the, the the technique about holding the uh, uh, binoculars is there a slight modification for people that do wear glasses? I haven't got mine on, but I, I do take mine off when I've got my binoculars up. But obviously, some people uh, are not uh, able to do that. Is there a modification to that grip that that takes the the spectacles into account? Yeah, I, because I, I do sometimes wear my specs. Let's just get that up there, um, like that. So I just hold them again. I put my my thumbs under my spectacle arms, like that, and just hold them in front of my specs. So oh, they're, not, okay. they're not actually touching. And it's so it's. I mean that that works for me. And um, the other thing which I possibly should have mentioned is all my binoculars now. Have this gadget on it. They're called they're called a bino bandit. Um, they come in various sorts of where's the other one gone? Various sorts of camo incarnations. Um, so the reason they're called a bino bandit is, you know, it's the, the sort of Zorro look. You know, it's sort of uh, okay. <laughs> uh, and they they were they're made uh, basically for people who um, use binoculars for um, field sports. I believe they call it. You know, sort of, but they give you, I, I reckon they give you about an extra half magnitude and they are absolutely delightful. They, they, you get much more immersive experience with them. So, so all, all my binoculars now have, have this thing on. Because it just bino, makes it. Bino bandit. Bino bandit. Bino bandit, right. Okay, we'll make a, we'll make it out of that. Grant is out on the product list. <laughs> It's from Vortex, so it should be. Um. Yes, it's, yeah. Yeah, v Vortex are, are the importers into Britain. They're made by an outfit in the States called Alpine Innovations. And the nice thing about them, you see on, on this one here, is they actually double as um, eyepiece covers. Whoops. Whoa, everything's falling off there. So they double as eyepiece covers. Not... Not perfect, but you know they are. They're good. They're good enough. They, good they enough. work. Yeah. yeah. Right. I shall make a note of that. Bino Bandit. Right. Okay. We'll um uh, we'll do that. Um, um, Mark, Mark, Mark of Beaufort. Good evening, sir. Uh, Mark, do you want to ask your ask your question? Yeah. Okay. Hello, Mark. <laughs> Hello, Steve. I mean, you and I have been chatting for years about binoculars. We uh, have, haven't we? <laughs> And, and and as you may know, I actually got some Apollo 15 by 70s. And one of the things I enjoy doing is actually screwing either UHC or oxygen three filters into the eyepiece. And mm. the amount of different objects you can see. I mean, I, the other night I was looking at the Pac-Man, never mind the helix. I just wonder whether you want to mention anything about using filters on binoculars. Anyway, it's nice to see you again, not in the flesh. And, <laughs> yeah, and nice to see you, Mark. Hope you're keeping well. Right, um, the ones that uh, Mark was talking about, the Helios Apollos, 
some of the, some of them, the, the, the 15 by 70s are, are one lot. Um, they have one and a half, one and a quarter inch filter threads in the eyepieces so that you can screw um, normal sort of standard uh, one and a quarter inch filters into it. And UHCs, I, I, I usually muck about with the UHC if I'm using a filter. Now, most binoculars, you can't do that. But if you've got the ones with the squidgy um, rubber eye cups, mm -hmm. you can actually just drop the filter into there and hold it in place just by squeezing the eye cup. And it makes an enormous oh, difference. You, you, can also, you can also blink it. Um, so you can, li literally blinking. So you can, you can see the thing coming, coming and going, which is, uh, which is quite fun. But Mark, I think you, you use, uh, sometimes you use a UHC in one and an oxygen three in the other? I use the Teleview Nebula Star 2 in the one, and I use an astronomic um, oxygen three in the other. In fact, um, about a week ago, I actually used the Teleview Nebula Star in the one and a Lumicon UHC. And I was actually able, because my garden's quite dark at the bottom, I was actually able to see the California Nebula. It was, it was glowing. So that, yeah. that, I mean, it's just, it's a thing you would never see normally, but I, I got the glimmer of the California Nebula with the, with the 15 by 70s. Yeah, you can, you can just catch it on a really good night when it's high up with, without it. But yeah, it's a really difficult object, isn't it? Yeah. I, right. I didn't realize that, uh, uh, you, and that's a good tip actually, putting the filters in, in the eye cups and just uh, squeezing those, but I didn't realize that yeah. you got- um, I'm sure you could 3D print something, Daz. I reckon you're probably right, mate. <laughs> yeah, and the, the th of course the thing to to be, to be aware of that, and this is one of the problems with the Helios Apollos, because of that, with it with the Helios Apollos, you're losing a lot of your a lot of your eye relief for spectacle users, and they're not, and though they're not brilliant for sp for spectacle users if you've got that, because your your eye relief is actually measured from the back of the lens, not from where, where you can actually how close you can actually get your eye to the thing. Okay. And that means, um, and, and and that means for a lot of spectacle users, they just, they just don't work. Um, the yeah, and the, of course, if you've got these twist-up eye cups like this, then of course the filter thing doesn't work with that either. Uh, yes, my um, what have I got? My mine has got the I can't remember the brand now, but mine has got the twist-up eye cups. But uh, yeah. but as, as Grant says, I'm fairly sure I could. Uh, uh 3d print something to uh to hold the filter in place and slot it over the top or something but um, there we go yeah or that will take the filter out of its um, one and a quarter inch cell holder and maybe something a 3d printer drop into yes mm. yeah absolutely hold the filter there It'll give you give you more leeway with it well we've got a whole bunch of cloudy uh winter nights coming up so there, that'll be something to think yeah. about uh, <laughs> that'll be something to think about on that um excellent uh well see that was very comprehensive uh, the questions have gone uh, have gone very quiet but lots of thanks for the um lots of thanks for the talk uh so again the recording will be up uh, and obviously links to uh links to binocular sky will be there as well in fact that's one thing i'm going to do tonight is now going to have a play on i've always wanted to see kemble's cascade and i always always managed to miss it so uh i'm gonna go off and uh, get a find a chart for that one now <laughs> yeah do, do that and there's uh yeah i know some p few people around here here from around our way so david and peter our skies are clear mate <laughs> get out there and... <laughs> i think that's why dave had his uh, his hat and gloves on earlier he, uh, yeah. he was out plate solving <laughs> and getting and getting set up yeah when you finish with those guys can you send them um, slightly over to the uh, to the east of the country please that'd be great thank you very much uh, and of course we'll get uh, we'll get links to the books up um, uh, on the page as well steve so um, well uh, there's, again yeah I, I should say they're available from all good booksellers including first light optics <laughs> who very, who very kindly <laughs> take them i also didn't realize the the thing on your your website um, steve we've uh, been able to find the objects and see the 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 find the views and the sky charts i think that's fantastic I, I hadn't seen that so that was a good good reminder oh thank you, oh, thank you. yeah no, it's, yeah it was really I was, I was trying to teach myself how to you know sort of use databases and stuff like that it's, it's but nice to, to have done 300 have objects that's phenomenal that is good yeah yeah that's some going so uh, yeah because of course it's not just you know it's not just the whole setting of the web page it, it's it's the information as well isn't it steve it's mm. uh you know getting that write-up done and getting the um uh the oh, charts and uh, the whole charts. yeah it's uh yeah absolutely it's uh yeah great effort great effort and like i say i'm definitely going to go off and um 
uh, to go and find Kemble's Cascade. So I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll keep, you, keep you posted on my success or otherwise. Oh, last, <laughs> right. minute, last minute question from Alien 13. Oh. Why did 7x50 binos fall out of favour? Um, 7x50s um, with really came into favor with military, particularly the Navy, because they're easy enough to hold steadily to see something on the heaving deck of a boat. Um, there are some, but I think very few objects which are actually better in 7x50s than 10x50s. As we get older, our eye pupils don't open as much, so the 7x50 effectively becomes a, you know, a 7x40 or something like that. So we're we're losing light anyway. So we might as well either get a, a smaller binocular, like a 10, uh, 8 by 40. Um, but 10 by 50 gives you more magnification, which means it darkens the sky background. And I th and you get better contrast. And I just think they are, I see more with them. Now, other people disagree. I know um, Oli Penrice, he much prefers his, his 8 by 40s. Um, they are smashing little binoculars, I have to say. Mm. Um, but you know, there's it's it's a case of finding what works for you. I think Happy Cat's put put up there. You know, she's said not not gonna not gonna risk receive the specs. The knocks work well, and I don't want to see what they're not and what they say on the box. Exactly, if they work well, that is the definition of a good binocular. It's what works for you. And most of us find that if you can hold them steadily, a ten by fifty seems to be the sweet spot. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you very much, yeah. Steve. Uh, Grant, who's um, who's on um, for next week, please? Uh, so we we were having a bit of a break next week because um, of of Kellen and a lot of people being there, um, and we haven't got a speaker lined up. So we'll be returning a week after that with hope. Oh, okay. Something a bit different. So yep. Yep. be announced. Oh, actually, there's uh, there's another one uh, coming just at the last minute. Um, Mark Henthorn says uh, you made no mention of uh, binocular mirror mounts. Do you have an opinion on them, Steve? Yes, it's not very polite. Um, <laughs> um, no, some pe some people swear by them, and I I know this. And there's you know some people find them really really useful. I find that you know any upward facing surface, it attracts biscuit biscuit crumbs pollen dew and then everything's reversed as well and you've got to you've got to oh, I, I just i just i'm i did make one once many years ago um i gave it just away. To be clear this is this is this is the thing where you've actually got a, a mirror um uh, underneath the, the the main objective lens and it's look at you're looking down and the mirror is obviously looking up isn't it you look down at a mirror and then you adjust the mirror yeah to move your way around the sky yeah okay and there's um I just find them such a faff, and I I think the fact that nobody's making them commercially anymore is a um, indication of how popular they are. But, but but some some people really really like them, and I suppose you know if you've got neck problems or something like that and find them much more comfortable looking down, then yeah, absolutely. You know if it if it works for you, use it. The other yeah. thing I didn't mention was image stabilized either. Um, mainly be, I, I think they're great. Um, don't get me don't get me wrong, but I think I can see. With what my decent 16 by 70s and a monopod and trigger grip head cost, I can see more, much more with that than I could with image stabilizers costing the same amount. So it's, a, it's for me, it's bang for bucks. But for if but if you want something really, really portable that will show you much, much more, yeah, image stabilizers are great, particularly the Canons and catching up our Opticron. So that's okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, but as you say they're not uh, they're not the cheapest things, though, are they? No, no, it's yeah. it's and the the, the Canons now are, are using the same image stabilization they use in their top end lenses now, which is which is why you know you sort of you look at the price of the uh, the Canon. I think they're ten by forty twos or something or something. I can't remember now. The ELs, um, you know, they're, they're the you you might want to think of taking out a mortgage first. <laughs> <laughs> they are they they are they're pricey, but you know that's but you, you're you're paying for good glass and and innovative electronics. It's yeah yeah yeah, yeah very yeah. true yeah very true. Uh, excellent, right? I definitely think that is it. Then there's the, there's no more coming on that. So uh, so once again, Steve, uh, great to see you again. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks, My Steve. pleasure. Thanks for asking me again. Um, night, everybody. Get out there, folks. It's a lovely night tonight in the south of England. So <laughs> have, a, have a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. See you in a couple of night weeks. All. Thank you. Bye -bye.